Hey, this is Todd. I'm uh, getting ready to do some more work on my campaign, my adventure setting. So let's pull that back up and see what we can see. For this hour that I've got to fiddle with this, I wanted to concentrate on factions, or I wanted to work on factions. So I've uh, collapsed the nodes in the mind map under point of interest and resources, location, climate, and faction, or sorry, and not factions, leaving factions alone so that, so that we could work on those. Just to recap, we did what I did in yesterday's uh, lunchtime GM prep stream. I uh, went ahead and created a location called Esmerdell after a place that my sister made. I think she sort of took the name from Frozen. Um, with the name of it, I can't remember, but it's close to Esmerdell. But she, anyway, she came up with her own Esmerdell. I decided to adopt that as the name of this starter location, starter town, if you will, that I'm imagining parties beginning at or perhaps traveling to and then picking up work. It belongs to a kingdom whose name I have not figured out yet. The local... Uh, the, the local... Uh, the local environments around there include a, a river, some farmland, which is basically civilized, so probably at the beginning not much is going to be happening there, and then beyond the river, forest, hills, and a mountain. Last week we threw some factions out there. We've got goblins and elves who are in conflict in the forest. We have giants, giant or giants, hadn't really decided how large a population there would be there that are in the hills, and then a dragon, we were thinking, and maybe dwarves in and around the mountains. We had also created two possible points of interest. The closest one, as far as if Adventures are starting Esmerdell, would be a temple, we thought, that uh, could be located in the woods. And then beyond that, having to do with the hills, would be mines that we haven't decided yet whether they would be operational or whether they were simply abandoned for whatever reason. That's how things stand uh, as my mouse goes dead. That's how things stand in at the moment with the setting. So what I wanted to do this week, come on mouse, there we go, back, is take a closer look at those factions, in particular the goblins and the elves, just because when I'm looking at the adventures that I want to put in this location, probably the first ones will be having to do with the woods. And so having to do with the woods puts them, would put the party immediately in contact with one or both of these factions. Am I spelling that right? Or sorry, I have Z, Z. That doesn't look right. Ah, my typing skills being expressed. Uh, that doesn't look right either. All right. I'm just going to say, oh, here we go, government. Uh, I want to write it out. I'm just, I'm going to say that the goblins are actually, they use, I don't know, what is it called? It would be a, an oligarchy, ultimately. I'll say they'll have a, that they have a council of elders that run the show. So the elves, I'm going to make these, and I'm not totally set on that. These are going to be by the book classic elves. I like to throw some wrinkles in there. I'm going to be doing stuff, like I said in the first stream, my ultimate goal with this is I'm going to place stuff that I create for uh, drive through or elsewhere in this setting. So I don't need to stick. I'm not doing DMs Guild, so I don't, I don't need to feel beholden to a particular type of elf. That said, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to get too far away. If I'm going to call them elves, they should be pretty close to by the book elves. Otherwise, I can just make up my own species for them. And I, and I might do that down the line. I might. But for this, the way I'm thinking of them is elves. And I'm going to give them a matriarchy for these elves. And let's see. So there's a... Let's call it mother. So we've got an oligarchy for the goblins. 
a matriarchy for the elves. Now, I was thinking about alignments, and even if I don't end up using alignments, I know a lot of people are anti-alignment and they think whatever, but particularly for me as a, as a DM, GM, referee, alignments are super useful because it's, it's giving me that snapshot into what they are without having to do a lot of legwork. If someone says to me, oh, I'm chaotic good, bam, I already have in my mind ideas about them that I can use. If they were to say, you know, try to explain chaotic good, or, you know, you could use it. I could write in here. So another way to do it would be to take something that I know, say, Robin Hood or Batman, and someone could say, well, I'm like Batman. Okay, that also gives me a strong image of how they would act in a situation. But for a lot of other things, it can actually be harder to come up with it. To me, I'm just used to alignment. So if someone says to me, oh, I'm chaotic evil, I have an idea what that is. If it was a player telling me that, then we probably have to have a discussion about what chaotic evil means to them. But since this is all for my own consumption, I don't have to worry about how does one person see chaotic evil versus another one. And it won't be the only descriptor I can do. It may just be that it's a just a good baseline. But I'm going to start with, I'm not even going to go with good or evil, really. I'm just going to really go, I'm going to go order for the, and I'll go chaotic. This, you know, old school, there was no good and evil anyway. There was just order and chaos. So I'm going to go chaos for the goblins. Can I move these down? That's fine. Okay, so we've got a council of elders for the goblins. We have chaos. I also like to think of other things. So for me, it's not just, I think of three different kinds of leaders or important persons. One is the government, who's running the show. Two could be a spiritual or moral leader. And they can be the same, though often they're different. So if we were looking at, in your average town, in a kingdom, the local lord is the governmental leader. Whoever the church or whatever temple system is there, the high priest or the cardinal whatever is the would be the religious person and there might be a third who we could call maybe the sort of underbelly type if there is one and there usually is even in small towns there's usually some kind of ne'er-do-well some kind of dirt going on who's the who's who's doing the dirt who's working against the grain so when we think about so we have the goblins we've got the council of elders for their religious leader i I'll probably come up with another name because I do find it's a little bit. So we'll go oligarch. So <clears throat> for their religion, I'm going to say it's ancestor Whoops. worship. And there will be a God attached to that, the day to day. And then there's some kind of shaman type who is the leader and then for the elves you know I, I, i'm not again i'm just gonna fill in they worship uh yeah let's see i don't know i'm gonna call it forest spirits or maybe i'll call it nature and again there's a, there can be a god behind the nature spirits but they they and i will call it the warden. The warden is there. Let me just check. I'm not looking at my own video, so let me just check to see that not everyone can see everything. Okay. I'm still visible. Um, all right. So we got the elves. We've got a matriarchy. What was I saying with order? Oh, right there. I should call that law. I don't know why I call it order. Law. They worship nature spirits or their spirituality, and they have a warden for that. And then, do they have someone else? So what could, what would be this sort of underbelly? It doesn't have to be crime. It could be something. So for instance, maybe with the elves, there's someone who is <clears throat> warmongering. 
Whereas maybe the elves in their finer or in their better moments are really just wanting to protect themselves from the goblins, protect the woods from being uh, abused, work at a defensive level that we can appreciate that there's a force among them that's trying to actively go after the goblins, push the boundaries. And let's see. What kind of uh, uh, palm hunter right now? So here we have three forces within this faction. And they're important because, or they're useful, because one, it just gives us ideas of things to do and how we can, you know, so if I'm, Automatically with these three things, if I were to imagine what the, say, the, the chief village of these elves might look like, I can think along the lines of, okay, they worship nature spirits, so that gives me an idea of maybe what some of their iconography is going to be like, and there's going to be some kind of temple, what might it be? If it's nature, maybe it'll be some way of manipulating the trees and the vegetation and the plants to, to do things, or even the animals as well. That's going to be a factor. It's a matriarchy, so how do I imagine that that might look? She's called the mother. So what kind of imagery does womb-like imagery maybe can pull in? And then there's a warmongering aspect. So if the party were to come and look in here, maybe there would be, uh, you know, they would see some of that too. In the, a little bit in the shadows, a little bit off the side. Something that is sort of simmering in the background, but maybe seeps out around the edges. Is kind of this idea that there, at least some of the elves are gearing up for war with this hunter at their, at their head. And then on the goblins, we got the shaman and the ancestor worship. We know there's a council of elders. What is there? What's in their underbelly? That's a good question. So what would be... I'm not trying to think of goblins as necessarily evil. I'm not... These are not the Tolkien-esque sort of uh, goblins or orcs where they're just birthed and evil. But I do... I don't mind the fact that certain species may be pred predicated on certain behaviors, so I don't mind that they're sort of chaotic and have an evil bent in general, assuming that they gr grow up in the same atmosphere, you know, the same circumstances. Their forefathers, it just tends to get the sort of attitudes and mores and everything just tend to get, you know, beaten into them over time, and so you end up with goblins that act a certain way for the most part, but if you took these goblins out or if you've treated them differently and exposed them to different things maybe they would turn out differently and i want each individual you know population that's grown up under its own stresses and had its own leadership that may be more or less connected to what's happening in the rest of goblindom to be different so i'm not set on them having to be terrible but just like the elves are in the hunter are engaging with their meaner instincts for the goblins what might be if we think about what they're trying to do so let's let's start there the goblins are in the woods and we haven't determined yet why they're there how they got there i have sort of in my mind this idea that maybe they were either sent out by the giants who live in the hills or they were pushed out by the giants who live in the hills so I am thinking then that they might be newer arrivals to these woods. And just like a lot of populations over time, if you think about in, you know, historical earth terms, you know, quote unquote barbarians, you know, tribes of peoples who were pushed out of where they wanted to be and end up being pushed into other people. And so there are conflicts there the same way the goblins, maybe they don't really want to be in the woods, but that's where they are. The river and the uh, the kingdom that's on the other side are certainly not open to them, and they may not be ready to even try to cross it anyway. So they find right now that they're in these hills. Now, we don't know. I talked about last time about the temple. Who controls the temple? Who's inside? Maybe the goblins somehow got in there, and now they're, they're sort of rooted in playing defensively, or they're trying to get in there. Something else. So... Whether they're in there or not, maybe the the part, the sort of underbelly is that you have some segment of the goblins that really want to uh, 
I'm trying to think of what the term would be, sort of tomb rob, what's a general, more general term, they want to, uh, I'm trying to, why am I stuck, armies, they do it, they, uh, they rob, they steal, they plunder, okay, so that's what I'll put down, they want to sort of plunder, and I'll put destroy. So we've got the goblins, and the goblins, they have, you know, the, what we could put here is maybe if the goblins there, they were in a safe position and everything was working in their favor, they may want to plunder and destroy anyway. But I'm thinking that their situation, what makes this sort of an underbelly for them or sort of a, a uh, an underground kind of counter movement is that they, the regular leadership doesn't put them in a position to do this yet. They've got too much stuff going on. They need to figure out either if they can hold fast in these woods somehow. They're holding off the elves. They could tell the elves are getting more and more angry, or at least they can feel that this warmongering faction within the elves is starting to make trouble for them. The last thing they want to do is do something to disrupt that or push that to the fore. So, for example... Here we have this temple. Let's say that the the goblins are in the temple, but they haven't really touched it yet. They've sort of left it alone. But they know that if they go in and desecrate it, they might find loot and treasure. It might give them a means to get out. And that's maybe what the plunder destroy faction, you know, internal faction wants. But if they do that and word gets to the elves, then it's on. Because the elves, as much as they may be able to think that, well, the goblins are in there, if they start breaking seals and going further in and desecrating the tombs within this temple, desecrating the holy areas, then there's no hope of peace. If the elves get wind of it, or maybe even some of the their magic sigils and somehow the, the priests, you know, the warden or the or the priests or whatever that are that underneath there somehow will get notified. Whatever it is, they don't want to do it. You're you know, they, the the plunder destroyers want just that booty, they want that loot. And the other, the Council of Elders, doesn't want to rock that particular boat right yet. And even if it wasn't the temple, because another thing that faction might want to do is maybe they want to start raiding Esmerdal directly. Or raid some of the farms that, or outposts or things like that that are on the outer part. You know, not in town itself, but sort of, but within the, within the, uh, the barony or, or whatever, the, the, the area of Esmerdal, but not in town itself. Or maybe go up to those mines and the hills and make trouble there for loot. Whatever they do, the feeling, again, from the Council of Elders is, is we're not in a secure spot for this. We are small, we are not ready, and you're just, you're making trouble. And we can't have that trouble, because if you go and you piss off the elves and they decide to, like, if the warmongers, just what they need to make an all-out war, and we're not in a position to do that, that's bad. If you go and you pick on the kingdom, and they decide to, to retaliate, then that's bad, and it might also then push the elves to join that retaliation, which then just makes it a circle. So I'm going to call him the Reaver, and this will probably change, but it's a it's a it's a descriptive term for this particular leader. So now for each of these factions, we've got three different leaders. We've got a religious leader, we've got a government leader, and we sort of have this counter counter leader and we could do more potentially or we could list and i'll do one for esmerdel itself where i might go into not just sort of sub factions and leaders but important persons because for in that case i think the i imagine the party the adventures are going to interface a lot with the people in esmerdel so it's worth kind of giving them a bit extra detail as far as these the elves and the goblins go if I think they're in a spot where they're going to interact with a bunch of them, either during adventure or they, they just take them, then I, I might, you know, during adventure, after an adventure, something that they unlock, you know, say they do something good for the elves and the elves allow them into their village. Now, suddenly, then I would go in and maybe add some more people. But for right now, the stuff that, because this also represents the kind of things that will filter outwards from these factions. What I mean by that is that when we get to looking at what do the people of Esmerdel know? Or what do the people of Esmerdel suspect? Or what the rumors of things have come down to Esmerdel? 
we can use these three things to start to think about what people might know, what they may have heard, what might be true. Let's look at the goblins first. They may have heard that there's something to do with ancestors, that maybe they keep the skulls of their dead and in their, in their caves. And maybe word of that filtered out somehow. I don't know how it would necessarily filter out, but we could also look at it. Well, maybe the goblins interface with somebody in Esberdell. Maybe there's somebody who has dealings with the goblins in some way or shape or form. And that information came out. They certainly may have heard or seen, let's say, the Reaver. Maybe the Reaver is sending out scouts and little feelers and just taking a look. And maybe they've been spotted crossing the river or, you know, lurking, skulking around the edges of town or the edges of some of these farmlands. And that's filtered out. So you have this idea that maybe something's coming with the goblins. Something might be happening. Perhaps even that. It's not out of the realm of possibility that, that some representative of Esmerdell tried to talk to the goblins directly, and so maybe they met the Council of Elders, and so that's how they know, and we know, and or the players might know, that such a council exists. So that's the goblins. Potential for what people may know. Now we have the elves. By the book, you'd think that the elves and the kingdom that controls Esmerdell would be friendly with each other but i'm not i'm not taking that as written that's true these elves might be very xenophobic and i'll go we you know we'll go into some more uh descriptors or, or kind of more ideas of what these different factions are like as we go but it's possible again just like with the the goblins that there had been some direct contact maybe hunters or woodsmen or other people who are prospectors because remember we we had established that there was gold and copper that had been found in the river in the hills so that they maybe had they'd gone in the woods looking for those veins and they ran across the elves so it's very possible they ran into that matriarchy or elements of that and heard of the mother and brought that back certainly if they had come to kind of those elves it's very possible they had been told or warned or anything else about the nature spirits that the elves hold dear which would probably predicate them to being a little bit anti-prospecting and digging up stuff in the woods or, you know, gathering wood or those, those sorts of things. So that might something else that might've been mentioned. It could be that uh, some hunters or people were chased off the forest. And that would indicate that warmongering, that hunter who is, could not just be anti goblins, but anti anybody going in the woods. So that people who'd gone in the woods, who maybe their fathers or their uncles, or when they were younger, or just weeks ago had been able to go in and been, sort of been able to go about their business, now suddenly they're being scared off, chased off, not allowed entry. So all that stuff leads that we have these things that now could be passed along as some sort of information. And we can add more in here, even some of the things we can have that maybe aren't true, but lead back to a truth. So, you know, if you look at a rumor tables, a lot of adventures, they usually give some things that are true, some things that are false. We can even think about things that might be true and might be false about, say, the nature spirits. They're all going to point back to the fact that there's this nature spirit religion amongst these elves. But not that doesn't mean that everything that we attribute to them through these rumors is true. But the rumors, true and false, will both point back to this truth, this origin, which is that, yes, they do have nature spirit worship. So what might that mean that's true is maybe they do have a, a temple or, or church or chapel that's made of living trees that are you know woven together in some kind of interesting way that's true false might be that there are um totems spread around the forest that do something have some sort of protection magic attached to it right so one is true one's false but they both lead back to the same thing so ultimately with this information we have on these kind of leadership is it's not just about well how are we going to organize them but it also gives us a lot of ways we can think about when we're trying to figure out what players know what the npcs that are around them may know and what could be discovered we have these things to help shape our thoughts and give us that inspiration i'm trying to think what else oh so i thought about we could add some so i got about 30 minutes to go so we're about halfway through this stream so let's look at adding some more i just want to add some 
uh, characteristics. No, I didn't want to do that. What's the kind of character like the people? So I'm gonna I'm gonna say these elves are xenophobic. They don't they don't tend to like anybody. People, goblins. They sort of want to be left themselves to themselves. Uh, and I'm trying to do ah, oh, there goes my mouse again. I'm using this Bluetooth mouse. I don't know why, but it just loves to lose connections. Okay, so. I like to mirror this stuff. It, it's, you know, it keeps me uh, sort of in check organizationally. If, if I can, when I'm, I'm, I'm doing one set and then I do another set, I go back and forth. The other thing is these two peoples in particular, I'm setting against each other in conflict. So it's good for me to compare how they're alike, how they're different, how I can keep Putting them against each other to keep that to give these points of, of tension. So, for example, you have these two counter elements that neither of the main leaders of the faction wants, but they're both working in ways that are going to bring themselves together. The Reavers certainly would love any excuse to go in and plunder and destroy stuff and get that loot, and the uh, warmongers for the elves would love to have any excuse to go to war. If those two sub factions were to get their way, it would be great for each other. So they're, you know, they're sort of at, in a sense, they're working together, but they're also at odds because each one will set the other one off. You have this idea of, you know, chaos versus law and just how they think. The ultimately, the goblins, they're, in a sense, they're, you know, they're, they're capitalists. They want to look at what's around them and convert it to money, convert it into money and power. Whereas the elves want to preserve, they want to, foster this everlasting garden that stays the same. They are the opposite of wanting to convert things. They want to preserve. So if the goblin, if the, the elves are xenophobic, I'm going to say that the goblins are expansionists, and I will also say that they're Let's go ahead and call them capitalists. And these things, and, and you know, here I am putting them against each other. I'm not really thinking how this relates back to Esmerdel and where the party's coming from. I'm happy, I want these two to be in conflict, but I'm also happy to give hooks for the party to interact with them in different ways. So I want them to be able to go to the goblins and perhaps they can get, they can glean that the goblins are into money and into you know power and into doing and use it for their example because you can work with capitalists you could come up with deals you can you can you know you could talk to them you can make bargains with them you can trade with them they're open to it the elves they're not so much open to that they They don't want to hear about, particularly, you know, when you think about the classic adventures, they want to, they are essentially not that different from the goblins. They want to come in and they want to convert, you know, things that are buried in the ground and take it home and turn it into money and power. Tear things out. They don't necessarily want to destroy things like a forest, burn down trees and whatnot. But if, if there was a treasure chest under a tree and the only way to, to get to that treasure chest was to cut that tree down or burn it out or do something else, they would do it in a heartbeat. Which is does which puts them in a sort of similar similar uh, to what the goblins would do because that's all they want to do is they don't care about the natural beauty of the wood or you know we're not really worried about e the overall ecology or you know things like that but they're not they're not worried about preserving everything if there's something underneath it that they can convert to power and money they'll do it which puts them equal to the adventurers the adventurers should look at that and think yeah I, I understand that completely. Whereas the elves might be a little bit harder to deal with because they're not into it. If the party were to come in and say, oh, we found this giant treasure under this huge oak tree and we'll split it with you if you let us chop it down, the elves are probably just going to say no because they're not interested in that treasure. No matter how big that treasure is, you're probably not going to be able to convince them that they do it. They value that tree being there that's been there for a thousand years that they want they're maybe using their magics or whatever to make sure it's there for a thousand more 
or that it, you know, it's even eternal, they have no interest in making that deal. So there you have the fact that the, maybe that, you know, that the, the forces that be might be more in opposition to the party before the party does stuff might actually be the elves over the goblins. Now, depending on how the party shakes out, who they are, you know, what they're composed and what their goals are, it's most likely they'll feel more sympathy for the elves than the goblins. But we don't know, you know, but just looking at these characteristics, it could be very much in play that the goblins end up being more palatable partners who can be on the same you could talk to on the same wave, wavelength. They're more reasonable in a sense than the elves. But of course, the problem with the goblins is they're not going to stop at the woods. They, you know, again, much like people, much like uh, much like us in our world, and much like the, the the adventuring party, is that the problem with the goblins is is that it once they exhaust the woods, they're going to look elsewhere. They're going to look at Esmerdale. They're going to look at the farmlands. They're going to say, okay, now we can. Oh, wait, now we've 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 gotten all the loot. We've we've pulled out all the power and money that we can out of this woods, and we've chopped down all the trees. We've burned it all down. We've totally gutted it for what it's worth. Now let's go on to the next area and gut that for all it's worth. And I think that if, I think even on a meta level that there's a you know I think players sort of appreciate that. You're right. You at least as far as how it plays into the standard tropes is the elves may be haughty and they may be arrogant. And they may be whatever, but they kind of know their know their lane, and they're gonna stay to it. Goblins and and humans and a lot of these other races, they they don't see anything. They don't see a lane for them. They see the whole highway as being theirs, and so that yeah, you could talk to the goblins, you could trade with them, but ultimately, you know, when they finish those, they're gonna look at you, and they're not gonna look at you any differently than they looked at the elves. And so maybe helping those elves, even if it's only just as a buffer to keep the goblins in check is worthwhile even if they even if the elves are not as nice to deal with and they have more reservations and they're going to be strict and haughty and not nice and all that stuff you know so it's but you want to give the option so that's what we're doing you know by setting up these factions what we want to do is give the party options and it gives us options for creating content and manipulating that content to keep everything dynamic and humming along and introducing those opportunities to insert that the party can insert themselves into. So maybe if there's a goblin elf war breaks out, that could be a subject for an adventure. How does the party act with that? And how does that do? So since I'm trying to think of what else with these goblins, I think for right now, expansionist capitalist is good. Xenophobic preservationist is good. I'm trying to think what else I want to define with them right this moment. Because remember, this is not set in stone. We'll be coming back and editing these and changing them and adding more. I think maybe we should go into the kingdom because that is important. So I haven't set up my cosmology yet. So I don't know what... Uh, I'm just going to use organized religion of some sort. I guess I'll use I'll use feudalism here. Feudalism, and there's going to be a lord. I don't know whether I'll say I'll call a high priest for right now. Oh, you know what? Hold on a minute. Let me fix this. I want to. Oops, I'm trying to think here. <clears throat> really, what I want to do is I want to, uh, yeah, I'm going to set up a local branch because the kingdom is is larger than just Esmerda. At least that's how I think of it. So I'm going to. So I want to make sure that when I talk about the, oh, there goes my my mouse again. All right, local, and then okay, here we go. All right, and so what would be there? I'm gonna call. I'm gonna say that their sort of underbelly is expansion as well. 
that this is kind of that. Let's see if I can expand this to get some more space here. I'll let you check the stream. How am I looking? All right, I'm looking okay. All right. I'm going to say that uh, expansion is also the thing that they are baser instincts are. And let's see. Well, I'll just recall it. Call it the sheriff right now. So the local lord maybe employs somebody. I don't know. I'm just kind of riffing off of, uh, you know, Robin Hood type situation where you have Prince John and the sheriff, sheriff of Nottingham. So you have a local lord who's running things. You've got his, the, the persons that he employs to run law and order is the sheriff. And I'll go. I remember looking this up a while back and I'll have to look it up again to see if this is. I don't really care about the historical accuracy, but I'd like to get the, the titles at least close to being right. And then you just get more inspiration. So I'll, I'll check the stuff and see how it feels a little bit later. But for right now, right now we've got the sheriff as someone who is eyeing, expanding. Oh, you know, I'll, I'll make this local as well. Oops. Or maybe I should, I don't know, should I just put, I'll just call it as we go. Just to make it super clear, because we might have more of these when we do more towns. I might have to change some of the stuff around. I don't want to get too caught up right now in just organizing the mind map, since... I really more just want to make sure I'm getting all my ideas out there, and I don't care too much about the layout as long as it's connecting to the right kind of stuff. Okay, so we've got a sheriff who's interested in expansion, and that might represent an overall kingdom push. Usually leaders, it seems like they're never satisfied with what they have, so it makes sense to me that there's going to be at least some sub-faction in this kingdom, however large or small it is, that wants to get bigger. In Esmerdale, the person who is interested in this is the sheriff. The actual authority is the Lord. And there's some kind of high priest of the, whatever the largest church or cathedral or whatever it is around here, chapel, whatever it is, he's the, he's the head of the organized religion, which I haven't figured out yet. I think the one thing about the sheriff that interests me is because he immediately comes, again, it's a point of tension with the Reaver and with the Elves in general. Uh, going into there. Because the, well, I guess maybe not the, well, obviously you can't have these two. I don't know, actually, maybe, maybe that's not quite as correct. So it definitely puts him into direct conflict with the elves who obviously are going to be against any sort of expansion and they don't like people not from here anyway. Oh, really? It's more, I, I guess I should say more properly this, as far as the, as far as the goblins go. It's their expansion because you can't really have to expand. Yes, I know they could do some sort of uh, Stalin and Hitler deal to, you know, if it really got nasty, they could get together and then decide to push out the elves and split the forest together, ideally. But it's hard, it's hard to think how you can really have too much of a lingering peace, as was born true by the aforementioned Stalin-Hitler pact. Two expansionists yeah, organizations that are going to be right next to each other. Because eventually, either in the short term or in the longer term, one of those two is going to want to expand into the other one. So there we go. We've, we've set up between this third faction a tension spot. And it, you know, between these other two factions. And it also, it gives us something to play with as far as when we're looking at the atmosphere of this area. What is this atmosphere like? This Esmerdale, it's on this sort of border. Okay, so the borders already gives us this idea of we have 
one say one side that's settled the other side that is at least to the people of the kingdom unsettled you know if they were romans they would be looking at oh those are barbarians on the other side however it is obviously the other side the elves are probably looking at the kingdom people and saying you guys are barbarians and definitely you goblins are barbarians we just want to be left alone with our trees and the goblins are thinking i just want to burn down the trees so that we can do something with that wood or get whatever's underneath it or whatever it is and then move on to the next move on to the next thing additionally we can play with in the atmosphere just how we're describing stuff the fact that there is a tension in the air maybe people are talking about that there could be war brewing or some kind of conflict because you basically have three sides that all have some sub faction that wants to make trouble for the others the reavers want to make trouble the hunter wants to make trouble and the sheriff wants to make trouble and they're all eyeballing each other and they're all making these sort of cold war moves it basically is exactly what it is it's, it there is a cold war brewing in this area around Esmerdel, as each one of these sub factions isn't strong enough to make an outright move so what they're going to try to do is they're going to try to manipulate things to make the move for them or force the other side to make a move for example the elves might start harassing the goblins more trying to goad them into an attack the Reavers might be pushing to get into some of these closed off areas in the temple if they're there or to get to the temple themselves if they're not there under the idea that they need to get better protected because the elves are harassing them. And if the elves, even if the elves aren't harassing them, maybe the Reavers are trying to plant false stories that the elves are doing this stuff to try to get things moving in their direction. If the goblins are sneaking across the river to take a look-see at what's maybe easy pickings over there and reports get to the sheriff he's definitely going to play those up to the lord to see if he can get extra authority or maybe get some kind of war party put together so he can go across and maybe the same thing with the elves maybe he's planting stories about there being even more xenophobic than there are or the elves are truly being very xenophobic towards the people and those complaints are being pushed up by the sheriff to try to get the lord to sign off on some kind of expansion or even maybe the sheriff's trying to go over the lord's head to a higher authority in the kingdom to get these things done so you have all this stuff brewing this cauldron is brewing with all this stuff bubbling nothing's ready to boil quite yet but it's at that little like simmer it's just below a simmer and now you can throw your party in there and even if they have a task that doesn't have anything to do directly with any of these factions or anything going on just by putting them in the mix and making them navigate through all this stuff, inevitably they're going to run into things, and how they then react to those things then can set off other things like dominoes. So let's look at one we, uh, an idea we talked about in the last stream was that there was something, trouble was happening at the mines that are in the hills. Now, the, there are probably several ways to get to the hills. One would be to stay on one side of the river, go up and kind of wherever the river goes into the hills, then you cross over there and, and, and just do it that way. Maybe you can ride up. I don't know how, how heavy the flow is of water, what the current's like, but maybe you can pull your way up the river or row your way up the river there, or you can maybe cross over and go up. Either way, however you go, you're going to run into stuff. Maybe you run into goblins who are on the far side of the river and you give chase to them. Maybe you kill them, maybe you don't. But what happens is, is however you respond off screen to you, the adventuring party, things may start shaking out. If you find some goblins on the side of the river and you kill a couple of them and a couple of them escape, that may set off dominoes that you have no intention, but you're going to have to deal with and everything else is going to have to deal with. Because what does the, if those were the Reavers, you know, part of the Reavers gang or their group, they are a sub-faction, how do they handle that? What do they do with it? Do they then try to make that out like aggression on the part of the kingdom and that they need to respond to. If you go back and you tell the sheriff, hey, there are goblins seeking across the river up there by the, the mines, then how does the, how does the uh, sheriff react to that? And, you know, or it could be that they run into the elves for some reason. Maybe they decide that the fastest way to get to the mines isn't to follow the winding course of the river. It's to cut through the woods. And to do that, they run into contact potentially with the goblins and with the elves. And how do the elves deal with that? Maybe the elves, again, depending on how the party plays it, 
Maybe they have some someone speaks Elvish and is able to communicate, and they're able to get passage. They they do well on whatever social skills they have. Maybe they bumble it up and they get the elves pissed at them. Either way, again, things are set in motion. And one of the things <laughs> I keep saying things. One of the uh, benefits of having this kind of situation, and I think I talked about this in the last time too, what is that you get your party thinking about these elements. It's not just that you're trying to gotcha them. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Oh, you did this to the elves, gotcha. You did this to the golems, gotcha. It's that you're developing this sort of dynamic place that makes all their decisions, really gives them extra weight because you take something simple as we got to get to the mines and they're going to look at their map and they're going to say, how do we get to the mines? Okay, we just go through the woods, we get there. In some games, that would be just, okay, boom, you just travel across three days later, maybe we'll roll for a couple of random encounters, and, oh, you're at the mines. Once you get this stuff in play, and you've gotten the information out there, and you've gotten the players with all the information, now suddenly they really have decisions that are impactful, and they'll know they're impactful over something that would be a non-decision, maybe in another circumstance, which is, we got to get to the mines. Well... It goes from being simple, well, let's just take the most direct, easiest path to the mines that go, to, ooh, well, if we go through there, we already pissed off the mother and the elves once. If we go that way, they're going to make it difficult for us. <clears throat> they're going to make it tough. And, you know, we're already kind of on our first warning with them. But if we go on, the goblins are definitely going to make trouble. Oh, but we did pick up this stuff. It's possible we could trade with, maybe we could trade our way through and say, we bring the goblins something that they want, and we can give it to them and get free passage going back and forth that way. Maybe she would avoid them. It's longer and take the river. But that puts us near to the giants that we've heard are on that side of the hills. We were hoping to avoid them. So, ooh, what do we do? Maybe, maybe we can get the elves something and they can do this. Or maybe we can make a promise or we can spar fealty or whatever. So you can see now they have a lot more difficult decisions and those decisions lead to other things. If they decide, ooh, let's, what can we give the goblins to buy passage? That choice opens up other adventures. Well, we don't have anything on us to give to the goblins, but I'd heard about this, that, and the other, so maybe we can make a detour, see if we can find this. Oh, I heard that their leader really loves these berries. These berries only grow way out there. Well, let's try to see if we can make dice to get those berries. Or say for the elves, oh, there's a seed, oh, there's a tree. Some famous tree, type of tree. It's very rare, but I, I'd heard something about a seedling of that tree. It only grows once in a, sprouts once in a hundred years, but it's coming up. Maybe we can get a hold of that seedling. That can be the offering we can give the elven queen to get off our back. Or, you know, whatever else. Or maybe we got to figure out some other way around it. Maybe I got to find a spell of teleportation circle to get through, and that's another adventure. So what I'm saying here is that you're setting up all this complexity, not just for complexity's sake, but for, uh, you know, one, inspiration, so that when you're looking at these different, each one of these factions, you have all these different things you can pull off of that will just give you imagery. It's really imagery for your mind. So I wrote here, for the goblins, there's this leader of the sub-faction called the Reaver. So even if I don't use that name ultimately, but when I think about Reaving, oh, okay, that gives me images that in my mind. It gives me material. Same thing for the mother as the leader of the elves that gives me other imagery and other things to deal with i can look at their characteristics and think okay they're into capitalism and expansionism that's great and maybe i'll write here for whoops oh wrong one for the kingdom i'll just add i think i missed something add here i'll put control which is a little bit different than just being capitalist. They don't want to just uh, take advantage of it. They want to control it. What does that mean? So knowing for the kingdom that they want to expand, they want control, that gives me ideas how to flavor what they're like, what the authority figures are like, what the feeling of the place, the, 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 the uh, atmosphere is like in, in these places. Then it also gives me all these tension points between these factions and within them, within the factions, within these sub factions. So that not only can I think about, well, the goblins and the elves are, have the, are, are in this tension and now the party inject itself between there. Maybe when the part, if the party goes to visit the goblins, they get injected into the tensions that are running within that group between the council of elders and the reaver. Same thing potentially with the kingdom. 
maybe things happen and the party has to go and tell the Lord and the sheriff about this stuff. And what do they have to say? How does that affect what the sheriff's going to do? How the sheriff responds? How does that affect how the Lord will respond? Same thing with the elves. When they have to go and talk to them, they get to not only interact with the tension between the goblins and Esmerdel and the elves, but then also with the mother and the hunter and maybe even the warden of the religious side. So we have all this, all this material. And this material also means that when I'm going to write adventures, I can, instead of trying to imagine certain static events, I can really play into these factors that are going to be happening. Whether I want to just engage one, you know, myself, just pressing the button to say, okay, the elves and the goblins have gone to war. And that's, that is now the focus of this adventure or the backdrop or the thing that's happening there. Whether it's now I can make a whole table full of events and I'll know what these events are going to, how these events are going to play out in some degree because I know about these factions. An event could be that there's a goblin and elf skirmish. And what does that mean? Okay, now I can think about things. If that event comes up, now I have ideas what to do. I don't, I don't need to, I will still obviously have to improv exactly what's happening, but all this imagery that I've had built up here will allow me to really hopefully get into that moment quickly or even riff off of it and say, ooh, what if the party runs into the remains, the sort of aftermath of a skirmish, but the reality was it was set up by the sheriff, that the sheriff somehow got in there, killed some goblins, killed some elves with his men, and then planted it to make it seem like those two were at war, right? Why might he do that? He's trying to, again, provoke the warmongering hunters or the reavers to do something which then will make it easier for him without getting his hands directly dirty because he doesn't want him killing elves or goblins himself might seem like an overreach that's happening in the woods. I'm assuming his jurisdiction ends at the river. So he can't be seen to do that himself, but he can try to feed the fires. So that might be something, right? And I just, that just came out of my brain, but it came out because I had all these ingredients already laying around that allow me to allow my mind to put these, you know, these sort of arrows like we're doing here, these arrows of connection. Now I, I can build all these different arrows in all kinds of different directions between all these different things. And I'm losing my voice, but it's Friday. So it's all right. I think I will probably wrap things up here so just to finish off before i kill the stream we've we went into three of the six factions so far that we have we went in and developed some things about them we gave them each a government and a governmental leader an administrative leader a religion, spiritual path, and a spiritual leader, and then a sort of anti, uh, anti-faction and an act anti-faction leader. So for the elves, we went with a matriarchy and a mother. We gave them a, a sort of natural spirituality, spirit, natural spirit religion with a warden who's the leader of that, and a warmongering anti, anti sort of uh, administrative faction with the Hunter, the anti-government, the, I guess anti-faction is a good word, with the hunter, and we also get into characteristics that they're xenophobic and preservationist. For the goblins, we went with ancestor worship, where they have a shaman who's the leader of that. We went with an oligarchy and a council of elders for their, uh, you know, who's the government. And then for their anti-faction, a plunderers, destroyers, led by the reaver. And finally, for the kingdom, at least the locality of Esmerdel, it's feudal, so it has a lord. We haven't really determined the religion yet, but it's organized, so it's going to be you know, either some kind of temple system or church system. And right now we're just calling it a high priest as far as that. And the underbelly is the sheriff who is expansionist. Oops, somehow I had... Oh, and they all... Expansionist is the sheriff who is a you know works for the lord as far as law and order but has who is but is also this 
uh, wants to increase the uh, Esmerdel and the and the kingdom's lands. Also, I could probably put a connection here too, because he's also interested in controlling. Wants to expand expand the control and the territory of the kingdom. And I just put some other arrows between him because he also there's whoops there's tension. Just highlighting the tension between him and the expansionist characteristics of the goblins and the xenophobic characteristic of the elves. But I think not. But but uh, I think that's a good spot to end it. Again, we'll you know these things. It's not that this will be the last time I'll look at. Um, I will I will look at factions, but for now this is a good place to wrap it up. If you're watching this today, have a great weekend. If you catch this, uh, you know, wherever you happen to catch this, if you, you know, give it a thumbs up. If you're on, if you're on Twitch, hey, go ahead and follow us so you can see when these streams are coming. If you're on YouTube, uh, give us a thanks and thumbs up and subscribe. But uh, until next time, I will talk to you later.